after we are on live. Deepu sir, you can start. Are we live? Yeah, I just need to. Yeah. Well, uh, good evening, uh, good morning, uh, uh, depending on the part of the world you're in. Uh, uh, we're very happy to welcome you to today's lecture uh, at the Center for Study of Development Societies, Delhi. Uh, my name is Avdendra Sharan, and I currently serve as the director of the center. And joining us today is Dr. Elizabeth Chatterjee from University of Chicago to deliver uh, the first of what we hope will be a series of lectures on the theme of climate thinking and climate action in South and Southeast Asia. Uh, the idea behind these lectures is quite simple. Uh, uh, my sense is that how we frame the climate question, uh, both historically and into the future, has an immense impact on how we make our choices about conducting our lives from agriculture to transport and from architecture to energy. And equally, uh, the way we organize our lives has an impact on the kind and degree of climate change that we are witnessing. So what we're doing is inviting speakers uh, to choose the theme, to choose the period, uh, and to also obviously uh, uh, suggest to us how all of this remains deeply political and ethical and not just simply technical. So we're very excited that Dr. Elizabeth Chatterjee will speak to us today. Uh, let me briefly introduce her. Uh, Elizabeth Chatterjee did her DPhil in international development from University of Oxford and is currently Assistant Professor of Environmental History and the College at the University of Chicago. Her research explores the history of energy and infrastructure with a particular focus on India from 1947 to present. And her argument, and I've read quite a few of her essays by now, a fascinating essays. Uh, one key argument that she makes is that fossil energy regimes in post-colonial states uh, was imagined and continues to be imagined as being in national interests. And once you make that kind of argument, it, it unsettles many of our assumptions about the history of energy globally and about the Anthropocene. And uh, for those of you who would like to read her more, uh, you can go to this uh, absolutely fantastic article, The Asian Anthropocene, Electricity and Fossil Developmentalism, Journal of Asian Studies, February 2020. And there are a number of other essays available online uh, for those of you who might want to read uh, Dr. Chatterjee on climate change. In addition, uh, uh, Dr. Chatterjee has written on uh, reforms in the power sector, especially in West Bengal. Uh, she's also written on state capitalism in India and, and a range of those kinds of subjects. Uh, today, she speaks to us on late acceleration, the early 1970s climate shock and the Indian emergency, perhaps for the first time that I've seen the emergency being linked to the energy crisis. And I'm really excited to hear your arguments about it. Uh, Dr. Chatterjee will speak for about 40, 45 minutes. And then after that, we'll have Q&A. Uh, just type in your questions in the Q&A box. So over to you, Dr. Chatterjee. Thank you so much for that far too kind introduction. Um, it's an enormous pleasure to be here with you all. Um, thank you as well, Awadendra, for the generous invitation. Um, and thanks for giving up some of your evening to hear this. As I was telling these fabulous folks from CSDS, this is a very new project. So I am very open to hearing your questions, your feedback, as I think about how to shape this project going forward. So on to then the late acceleration. Um, and what I'm calling the poly crisis of the early 1970s. Two months before the oil shock roiled the world, the Illustrated Weekly of India had already branded 1973, as you see, India's worst year since independence. Interviewed by Kushwant Singh, famously sharp penned, P Prime Minister Indira Gandhi agreed with this verdict with an enig enigmatic smile. With full color photos, the magazine listed the country's woes, power cuts, food shortages, inflation, unemployment, labor unrest, and an overall sense of anarchy and stagnation. It was a litany that probably sounds familiar. Like many countries um, in 1973, oh, maybe, it, um, can I mute you guys? Um, 
many countries in 1973 stood on an ecological and political crossroads. A half century on, I think the experiences of India at this moment really change how we think about 1973 in the historiography that's very dominated by the West and how we think of this as a moment of rupture. In the popular memory and the historical scholarship on the early 1970s, it is the oil shock of October 1973 that overshadows everything else. But more than a year before Arab states slashed production and sent oil prices quadrupling, something that might sound familiar today, India was already in the throes of a very profound energy crisis. And this was shared by many poor oil importing states who've been completely overlooked in the historiography of this moment and who experienced it as part of the oil shock as part of a broader climate, food, energy crisis or polycrisis. It's out of this polycrisis too that the vast and heterogeneous block that would become known as the global south actually could, took shape as a political project. So dislocating energy systems around the world then, the early 1970s crisis briefly unlocked, I think, a radical horizon of energy possibilities that played out very differently around the world. So Denmark, for example, began embracing wind at this point, Iceland geothermal, and in India it both brought, I would suggest, a twin set of fateful changes. And the most famous is that by the end of June 1975, Indira Gandhi had resorted to imposing a constitutional dictatorship for the first and so far only time in independent India's existence. The emergency, I suggest, was not a coincidence in occurring at this time, nor purely the product of uniquely Indian difficulties, but a dramatic reaction to a broader crisis of governability that was striking much of the world in the wake of this combined climate, food, energy shock that I want to talk about. Less noticed, um, I think it's familiar in India, but surprisingly few people have written on it, is a, a pivotal point with planetary ramifications in another direction. Indira Gandhi, as we can talk about, um, was something of a conservationist herself, and of course, a almost uniquely powerful post-colonial leader. And under her, the critique of Western style industrialism reached the very top of the Indian state. And yet, at the same time, her period in office also mapped along to the carbonization of the Indian energy sector, and especially the switch from hydroelectricity to massive coal dominance in electricity generation at this moment. So I want to try and link together these different themes of this climate food energy crisis, uh, political crisis, and this carbonization that happens. Why does this matter then? The second half of the 20th century has witnessed an unprecedented intensification of human impacts on the environment. If you look at almost any metric, we could look at population growth, say, we could look at carbon emissions as many do, we could look at fresh water and so on, or bi biodiversity loss. Somewhere around the post-war period, or we might say the post-colonial period, coinciding with around 1947, the planet witnessed a new phase in human relations with our surroundings. This is the period known as the Great Acceleration, the most anomalous period in 200,000 years of human existence. And accordingly, this great acceleration period from circa 1947 is now the leading contender for the official start of the Anthropocene as a formal new geological epoch in which humans have become the key drivers of disruption to the Earth system. But the great acceleration is a singular term that can suggest a singular and linear process of change. It actually does I think mask a lot of regional variation as well as fluctuation over time. And in this fluctuation over time, 1973 stands out for energy use at least as something of a trend break. So if you look at this uh, graph here, you can see that between 
1950 and 1973. It is the roaring economies of the golden years of North America, Western Europe, and Japan that really drive this unprecedented rise in carbon emissions. After 1973, and I think this is something that's often ignored by environmental historians, we can see that in Western Europe, there's a decisive slowing of energy usage per capita and an actual outright plateauing in North America. So much so that one leading scholar of oil entitled an anniversary piece on the 1973 oil shock, how the oil embargo saved the planet. Now, this is obviously putting it far too strongly. What I think did happen around 73 was a shift in the regional drivers of planetary wide environmental change southwards. Now, one part of this change has been well documented. That is the rise of the Arab petrostates in this moment. In the longer term, though, it's the shift to the great emerging economies of rising Asia especially China, but also India, that begin to become, at this moment, the leading drivers of planetary change. Now, this graph also shows the practical and moral difference in these regional drivers. India's per capita emissions still remain far below the world average, unlike China's, which now are above Western Europe's. But I think this is still very important if we are seeking to understand the key drivers of current and future change, we have to understand the key moments at which Asian energy sectors, India's energy sector was installed and its path dependent form was established. So I hope in a modest way then in this talk, I will begin to write back in the histories of poor oil importing countries into this otherwise well studied history of 1973 and in this way seek to understand something of this key turning point in India's rise as a so-called coal nation today. On then to the first part of this argument, the very distinctive experience of this 1970s polycrisis for poor as opposed to rich oil importing countries, the latter of whom have dominated the literature so far. Just I'll take you through the polycrisis. I'll then I'll turn to something of the argument on carbonization and then link this to the emergency itself. Indira Gandhi inherited a, a very troubled country, I think it's fair to say. After independence, India began an absolutely unprecedented experiment in human history, embracing universal suffrage despite low levels of uh, industrialization and relatively high levels of poverty and illiteracy. By 19, the mid 1960s though, the pretty respectable growth rates of the first 15 years after independence had come to an end, accelerating the contradiction then between the Congress's big promises to the electorate and the reality of scarce resources to meet those promises. The country's inability to feed itself had, of course, by this point precipitated the Green Revolution. But even this brought more political penalties than rewards as wealthy, newly wealthy farmers became the base of so much political and electoral opposition to the Congress. Faced with economic stagnation, then the entire edifice of state planning began to teeter. So two months before unexpectedly assuming the the uh, prime ministership in January 1966, Gandhi wrote to her old friend and soon to be principal secretary, PN Huxa, the food situation is precarious, industries are closing, there is no direction, no policy on any matter, the power shortage is acute. In words that appear prof prophetic in more than one sense, she concluded that India was, quote, at the beginning of a new dark age. The electricity sector was not spared from this. Um, India's electricity sector at this point remained very much a fragmented and undersupplied patchwork, barely a system at all, said the leader of the first energy su survey of India. Agrarian assertion and India, Indira Gandhi's populist turn only exacerbated these woes. Both at the ballot box and on the streets, green revolution farmers increasingly pushed back 
against any hikes in their electricity tariffs. So the, the key turning point here, I would say, is Tamil farmers' peaceful siege of Coimbatore in 1972 in order to demand a rollback of electricity tariff hikes. As demand spiraled far beyond supply, the power sector entered a period of chronic crisis. The revolution of rising expectations in the phrase that the US State Department popularized at this moment, that was shaking the increasingly noisy Indian democracy by the 1970s, noted the then chairman of the India's Atomic Energy Commission was quote, essentially that of energy use. So the revolution of rising expectations is an energy phenomenon. So far, I think so uh, expected, but I think what is also interesting is to zoom out to what else is happening at this moment. And as so often, the proverbial vagaries of the monsoon made an already bad situation worse. Across the planet, 1972 was a year of climate anomalies as the Pacific teleconnections of the uh, El Nino Southern Oscillation sent uh, atmospheric pressures and circulation seesawing around the globe. So you see in this graphic here, all the different areas that were struck by drought in 1972. Much of this is linked to El Nino. The causation is scientifically much more disputed for some of these cases. But what is not in dispute is this is a climate disaster um, from a fairly moderate El Nino, actually. So first of all, for example, um, El Nino devastated Peru's favorite, famous anchovy fisheries. With those fish went a crucial, crucial source of protein-rich feedstock for North American livestock, just as the American West was itself being hit by drought and by dust storms. Hardest hit of, of all was the West African Sahel, where an already years-long drought was intensified. At the same time, the Soviet Union was hit first by severe winter frosts and then by a prolonged summer drought, just as the Soviet regime linked its own legitimacy to rising standards of food consumption, especially for meat and dairy. Around the world then, people began clamoring for imported grain just as global food output fell for the first time since the Second World War. And the timing really could not have been worse. For a generation, the chronic surpluses being produced by hyperproductive American farms had stabilized the post-war food system, not least through the excess wheat that flowed to India in the form of food aid, staving off famines in the 50s and 60s. But American policymakers had increasingly come to resent the expense of propping up their own agricultural system and the world food system through subsidies. By the 1970s then, thanks to these rollbacks, American grain reserves were vastly diminished. It was at this very moment though, that the Soviet Union, hit by these climate shocks, emerged as a massive food grain importer. Taking advantage of the Nixon administration's uh, policy of detente, the Soviet Union carried off an enormous proportion of American grain in 73, 74, on such fav favorable terms that this became known as the Great Grain Robbery. Similarly hit by drought as well, China also began agricultural imports from the United States. So supply side and demand side shocks disastrously fused in 1972-73. The result, as CIA analysts wrote, was, quote, starvation for some, hunger for many, a rapid rise in food prices everywhere. And they warned that the Earth's climate might be returning to that of the Little Ice Age, quote, an era of drought, famine and political unrest. It was then a world food crisis not seen in a generation. In the West African Sahel, cattle died in droves and about 100,000 people died. More than 2 million people would be forced into refugee camps. Just a decade earlier though, I mean, this is the moment when Africa becomes synonymous with famine in 1973. But a decade earlier, it was of course, India that was seen as synonymous in the international development community with hunger. 
in India itself, the 1972 El Nino sent the waters of the Asian monsoon dropping uselessly into the Indian Ocean. In the wake of the Green Revolution, though, India was much better positioned than most developing countries to weather the storm. New agri agricultural inputs, I think most notably the state-sponsored spread of electrified tube wells to pump up groundwater for irrigation, had begun to free the most dynamic areas from dependence on monsoon rainfall. And the new food corporation of India had begun to build up buffer stocks as well. So as you can see here, um, in the 19, early 1970s, massive public relief efforts, like the one pictured, very narrowly staved off outright famine in Maharashtra. But the impact was profound. Excess mortality may have exceeded 70,000, uh, sorry, 130,000 in Maharashtra alone. Um, although this has not been traditionally called a famine and food riots broke out, bro broke out across the country as inflation, inflation rose steeply. As these, uh, the rainfall fell and winter snowfall and melt fell, so too did the country's great rivers slow to a trickle. And in this way then, the climate shock translated not just into a food shock, but simultaneously into an energy crisis, captured, I think, in this uh, phrase of the power famine. So hydroelectricity in 1971 continued to account for about 42% of all Indian electricity, barely lagging behind coal. This reliance on dams then translated a rainfall crisis into an electricity crisis. And at this moment, the country's thermal power plants could not pick up the slack. At the same time in the east of India was a similar coal famine driven in, in part by the well-known problems of coal transportation, the lack of rail wagons, and also persistently poor maintenance. Well before the oil shock then, India was already in the throes of a power famine and a severe energy crisis across the whole sector. International developments that are well known only supercharged these woes. After the Nixon administration unilaterally went off the gold, dollar gold standard in 1971, worldwide inflation accompanied the protracted breakdown of the Bretton Woods order. And interestingly, it, the Shah of Iran justified then oil price hikes, which had begun before the end of 73, by saying, we have to do this because food prices, uh, global food prices are rising. And these kind of hikes had begun to bite even before the fateful decision that October in the wake of the Yom Kippur War to embargo oil supplies to some countries and to slash production by these Arab states. At first though, Western observers were surprised to discover that their New Delhi counterparts were pretty sanguine about the oil shocks. And they even detected a certain schadenfreude. So cartoons at the time gleefully depicted Nixon as a belly dancer dancing for Arab sheikhs. Um, India, after all, was a champion of the third worldist insurgency that really peaked in some ways with the Arab embargo. And at this moment, India's oil consumption remained amongst the lowest in the world per capita. But with more than half of India's oil arriving from the Middle East and paid for in all too scarce hard currency, the uh, price increase just intensified the already existing inflation crisis. Oil, fertilizers and food abruptly came to account for about 80% of India's spiraling import bill. So Indira Gandhi told fellow Commonwealth leaders a cleavage had opened within the movement for global economic decolonization. Um, and you see here some of the responses at the time to the link between oil and infl the pre-existing inflation crisis. In turn, the energy crisis bled back into the food crisis. And I think this is why the poly crisis notion of multiple causality and self-reinforcing crisis is so apt. The Green Revolution had bound the most enterprising and productive farms directly to international energy markets via dependence on fertilizers derived from often natural gas, pesticides similarly derived from fossil fuels, 
and of course, cheap energy to power machinery and to power those newly important electric tube wells. So cultivators were liberated from the monsoon on one side to face new vulnerabilities on the others. And in this way, the food crisis only intensified. Through all of these nexuses then, the dependence on hydroelectricity, the spread of tube well irrigation, the scarcity of hydrocarbon derived fertilizers and worldwide inflation, the oil shocks and the food crisis reveal themselves as twin faces of an interconnected food, climate, energy polycrisis. The effects of this crisis cascaded through the Indian economy. Blackouts became front page news. They extended up to 16 hours in, in Calcutta, which is increasingly restive. In Delhi, they became so common that one five-star hotel actually installed telephones in the elevator because so many people got stuck in there. And inflation topped 30% prompting further food riots. In Bombay, for example, women growled politicians demanding a reduction in the price of kerosene, a key cooking fuel. Police stepped in to protect gas stations against mobs of farmers in Karnataka. And India had to approach the IMF for a loan. This culminated in the greatest assertion of labor power since independence as as many as a million railway workers went on strike in May 1974. Their leverage came from the ability to interrupt the movement of key commodities, especially coal. As George Fernandez, then a union leader, told a rally in Madras, seven days strike of the Indian railways, every thermal power station in the country will close down. But this is a telling moment in another way too. The Indian state cracked down with unprecedented use of violence and preventive detention. At the key, key railway junction of Mughal Sarai, which is the prime bottleneck for east-west uh, coal transport, electricity and water supplies were cut off to the workers. Um, and I think in this way, we can see the successful crushing of the railway strike that it presages the brutal tactics deployed a year, year later during the emergency. The state's control over electricity then might be fragile, but it could nonetheless be wielded as a cudgel. Now, the stage really seems set at this moment for a revolution in Indian energy policy. And I'm going to skate over this quite fast here. I'd love to talk about it further in Q&A. But at this moment, Gandhians and left wing critics began to question the entire development project, the project of catching up with the industrializing West, seeing the energy crisis as confirmation that this was a false hope. They found perhaps a surprising ally in Indira Gandhi herself, a lifelong conservationist. She would, as is well known, be the only foreign head of state to attend the famous UN conference in Stockholm in 1972 on the human environment. But this was not the full belly, the full stomach environmentalism, post materialist environmentalism of the West that was resurgent at the time. It was rather a call for global redistribution as she famously used her platform in Stockholm to mount. Her then advisor, Ramesh Tapper, was still more explicit, arguing for a reframing, not limits to growth in the name of the famous report, but quote, limits to waste to arrive ultimately at limits to wants or desires. This kind of call required international negotiations, not only over minimum standard, standards of living, but maximum standards of living. And here, you know, the planetary negotiations of the 2020s have nothing on the radicalism of the 1970s. This was a planetary imaginary of economic and environmental justice that would allocate fair shares to the Earth's resources. But such third worldist arguments could hardly keep the lights on in India itself. And so a variety of alternative solutions were proposed um, in 1973 and after. Some argued for renewable energy and perhaps the most uh, highly advocated solution was gobar gas at the moment, as you see pictured here. But the government's official energy prophesiers, futurologists, as they were called, suggested that these would take off only in the far off days of the 21st century. 
there were other options. Big dams still had their supporters, though that huge El Nino had shown their vulnerability, that they couldn't surmount the vagaries of the monsoon. And of course, there was a growing environmental backlash in Kerala's Silent Valley. The nuclear establishment took the opportunity as well to argue that only atomic energy could provide sufficient power, although that too didn't go anywhere. Energy con conservation also became a pillar of Indian energy policy at this point. So Indira Gandhi herself took a horse-drawn buggy to the office to dramatize the need to conserve petrol. And as you see here, she also very aggressively pursued oil diplomacy bilaterally in the Middle East, offering services like training fighter pilots in India to serve in Iraq. And you see here she is meeting Saddam Hussein. As all of this suggests, though in a very haphazard way, New Delhi's response to the energy crisis veered in one particular direction, and that is towards centralization in the hands of the state. Indira Gandhi's government had already begun to move into the energy sector, you know, getting involved via the Rural Electrification Corporation, set up in 1969, and building up India's own oil refining capacity on Indian soil. And thanks to this centralization uh, prerogative, it would be fossil fuels that filled the gap. Um, national planning had to recognize that India was land poor, went the argument, gas poor and oil poor. And that led back to the country's most abundant indigenous fuel. So one commentator wrote in the uh, government's planning general, Yojana, we must act as Ulysses did. We must tie ourselves firm, firmly to the coal bark before listening to the sirens of speculative new energy sources now being hawked by the very makers of the energy crunch. Now, this was hardly an obvious solution at the time. Even that commentator acknowledged that the argument, quote, may seem a cruel joke, given the well-known pathologies of the coal railway power sector at this point. Not least, it's well-known environmental problems. And we have in our midst a great expert in the history of Indian air pollution, but I think it's very striking in the image that you see here, um, you see the state power equipment manufacturer arguing, advertising their surfaces by uh, using the term ecocide that they will avoid. Ecocide was coined in the context of the Vietnam War and the use of Agent Orange. So this is an appeal for kind of clean coal before the letter. We, what we see here, I think, is a real acknowledgement that coal is a dirty fuel. But nonetheless, the government's Fuel Policy Committee endorsed coal in 1974 as the only possible solution and the fundamental key pillar for Indian energy policy going forward. So the 1974 budget quadrupled allocations for the coal industry and offered incentives for industrialists seeking to switch away from oil to coal. I think this is critical then. India was not inevitably a coal nation due to its resource endowment since time immemorial or the coal uh, colonial fossil coal economy, but I think was forged as a coal nation in this moment of crisis. Now, given the coal industry's dysfunction and fragmentation in private hands at this point, this amounted, this coal prescription amounted to a prescription for radical institutional reform. And so even before the Fuel Policy Committee put forward its final findings, very belatedly, the central government had already begun to act. In 1971, coking coal for steel was nationalized. And in 1973, the government moved to take over um, uh, coal mines for power, uh, power as well. Almost overnight then, 600,000 people became government employees. And the final company created in 1975 to bring all of these mines together, Coal India Limited, as is well known, would come to underpin the regional political economies of the coal belt as an irreplaceable source of jobs and welfare services in its new industrial townships. Nationalization was no panacea, of course. Given the time and investment required to develop the mines, there was a lag and the targeted, very optimistic uh, coal production targets just could not be met. Worse, 
the reforms themselves drove illegality in the coal mines. Legislation prioritized the power sector in ways that severed traditional coal linkages to small enterprises that had depended on coal as an energy source. So everything from brick kilns through to glass factories. If these employment intensive industries were going to escape bankruptcy, then the state would have to turn a black eye to a black market. Sorry, a blind eye to a black market. Pilfered coal then fueled the takeoff of coal mafias, most famously around Danbad um, in what is now Jharkhand, and the takeover by these coal mafias of unions and mine labour in the eastern coal block. It was a vicious circle because the more expensive that elections became, the more politicians came to depend on these rents, and in turn when they were in office, the more did Eastern politicians seek to milk the coal sector for political rents in turn. In this way, then, coal mafiosi merged with the political class around the East historic mining centres. And it's at this moment, then, that we get a move to outlying mines further south, further west, to try and get away from this political economy. In this way, then, gangsters, politicos, energy bureaucrats, small industries, power utilities, coal in India township dwellers and pensioners, miners, both formal and informal, all came together to form an enormously powerful block that would, once created, hold this coal-based political settlement in place. The share of the country's electricity in overall primary energy use then went up, and coal went up um, in tandem at this period. But this drive just further intensified the pre-existing power famine. Indira Gandhi, Pian Haksa and others increasingly then saw dark forces at work and wrote of, for example, um, in the papers you find they write of saboteurs in the electricity utilities, the state electricity boards. The notion that the country was under threat then from both internal and external enemies was starting to solidify around this crisis. And in the name of this emergency, India's democracy would be suspended for 21 long months. Energy crisis then translated into authoritarian political reaction. The final straw that broke India's crumbling democratic edifice was a minor one. As we know, a single justice of the Allahabad High Court invalidated Indira Gandhi's 1971 electoral victory and banned her from office for six years. Energy played a surprisingly direct role even in this verdict. Though major charges were dismissed, the prime minister was found guilty of misusing state electricity supplies to power loudspeakers during a rally. And again, with her political future hanging in the balance, uh, Indira Gandhi used the control over electricity to muster political support corralling uh, tens of thousands of electricity workers into attending mass demonstrations. So they were bussed in from Haryana and from Rajasthan. When this show failed, the president declared a state of emergency, suspending fundamental um, political and civil rights. Again, even on the night that the emergency was declared, June the 26th, 1975, electricity featured the state severed power supplies to India's uh, New Delhi-based media houses to suppress the news. And only three days later, when the censorship apparatus was in place, was electricity restored. What is overlooked, I think, in typical accounts of the emergency is that it was intended to be popular with a very specific constituency. And that is the wealthy urban middle classes who could uh, prove such a dangerous source of unrest when they were unhappy. So the price and availability of fuel, especially in urban areas, was one of the key commodities that the Intelligence Bureau documented, Gary gathered copious data, and Indira Gandhi herself scrutinized and annotated their weekly reports. Industrialists as well, had also called for a new development approach. And the regimes then took real pains to sell to this urban middle-class constituency and to industrialists, the emergency as a necessary response to this 
poly crisis, not least in energy provision. So as Indira Gandhi um, stated in words that then were emblazoned across billboards, as you see here, the emergency provides us a new opportunity to go ahead with our economic tasks. And she took to the airwaves to explain, our purpose is to increase production. One of the immediate needs is to supply power to agriculture and industry. Within a week then, the administration had revealed its 20 point program covering everything from bonded labor through to prices and endlessly publicized, even turned into a ballet apparently and a musical score by the Delhi police band. The eighth point promised an accelerated power program um, that is reforming the state utilities and huge new coal-fired power plants. More funding then was accordingly attached to electricity, both at the center and the state level than any other subject. At the same time, Gandhi demanded discipline. In a subsequent letter to the country's chief ministers, she commanded that they, the states put down ruthlessly power theft. In parallel with its move into coal then, the central government embraced an aggressively interventionist new role in meeting the country's long-term energy needs and very quickly put together a proposal to the World Bank to create these two new huge electricity enterprises. The National Thermal Power Corporation, NTPC in particular, became the single largest recipient of bank energy loans worldwide and India's single largest power firm. And as I've written elsewhere, it was a real new model of state capitalism designed with unusual autonomy to meet commercial goals of efficiency and profit making and with a direct line to the prime minister. It was designed then to be a force for state electricity boards to emulate. And if that didn't work, it could wield the stick of cutting off power to force them to be less profligate. So this is a newly corporatized, streamlined, muscular state intervention that we see here. Well before NTPC had even anything like a real organ uh, organizational existence though, union ministers declared victory in addressing the power famine. While austerity remained the overall watchword, there was a huge surge of resources and several power plants uh, were built at pace, helping to power a record harvest then in 1976 and rejuvenating steel production. So you see pamphlets like this one, manifold rise in power, nation on the move. Of course, this owed it much in fact to the return of much more normal weather. And so in this great cartoon by uh, the cartoonist Abu Abraham, uh, long a bet noir of the regime, a uh, victim of the censorship regime, we see the one year anniversary of the emergency being celebrated with many happy returns of the monsoon. Of course, this kind of propaganda that you see on the left here could, should not obscure the emergency's vicious nature. Just as power cuts helped to install the censorship regime, so did the regime use electricity to punish recalcitrant communities and individuals. So around Delhi, electricity was cut until men agreed to go for sterilizations in particular, largely Muslim majority communities. In Bombay, land was uh, raised of slums and handed to state energy enterprises. And finally, electricity was used directly to punish critics. This is the takeoff of electro torture at this moment that would become used then widely in Kashmir and Punjab in the Northeast. Political prisoners were tortured by inserting live electric wires in the crevices of the body. Electro torture tends to be favored in democracies because it does not leave marks. This combination of brutality then and centralization masked real fundamental weaknesses. In the words of the political scientists Lloyd and Suzanne Rudolph, they were the actions of India's paradoxically weak, strong state, which fused an authoritarian ability to command with a surfeit of societal demands that it couldn't match. And so, even after Indira Gandhi was thrown out in 1977, the power famine persisted and indeed only intensified in the 1980s. We then see this as the great age of farmers movements um, channeled through India's noisy democracy. Those kind of demands, I think, would have an ironic effect 
in that by physically overloading the Indian power system, they would inadvertently buy the planet a little more time by physically constraining how much demand India could meet. Now, I've yaked on at length for your evening, so I'll start concluding here. As the energy importing Global South reeled from the effects of the conjoined climate food energy shock that I've laid out, Indira Gandhi's uh, auto gulp was far from unique. So for example, and this is something I'd love to follow up further, we can look to Bangladesh. By late 1974, Sheikh Mujib Rahman, its founding father was lurching towards autocracy warning US President Gerald Ford that the world's youngest nation state faced a catastrophic famine worsened by high global oil and food prices. A year later, as many as 1.5 million Bangladeshis were dead, Majib had been assassinated and the, we'd, uh, the, the country would see two decades of military autocracy. In Ethiopia, the 1972 climate shock brought famine across the marginalized northern regions. At the same time, the oil shock worsened inflation and with it urban unrest, sending a taxi driver strike in Addis Ababa spiraling, spiraling into much broader protests. Popular revulsion about the indifference of the Emperor Haile Selassie helped to delegitimize his divine rule and bring a Mar Marxist-Leninist hunter, the Derg, to power. And finally, in Sri Lanka, one of the great human development stories of the post-war world, democracy would have survived formally, but widespread hunger and inflationary pressures, a bit like those we see today, eroded the legitimacy of the country's precocious welfare state. The election of 1977 then brought a paradigm shift towards economic liberalization, the rollback of welfareism, as well as an increasingly draconian executive presidency. These different histories of the 1970s energy crisis in the global south, I think, remain to be written, but they offer really interesting evidence on the kinds of deleterious societal effects that we can see as a result of profound climate and energy shocks. In India, India itself, the memory of the emergency faded remarkably quickly with the return of elections. Of course, the emergency left bloody fingerprints in all sorts of directions in terms of political practice, weakened state institutions, a politicized bureaucracy, the personalization and criminalization of politics, a penchant for electro torture, and the new legitimacy of jailed Hindu nationalists. But I think if anything, the, it's the institutional and ecological aftershocks of this moment that are just as significant. As you can see here, since 1970, electricity generation overwhelmingly from this point powered by coal has been the single largest component of India's uh, uh, emissions. And this is a pattern that looks very different, say to if we look at the US, transport would be the largest single sector. It's at this moment then in the early 70s then that it becomes clear to state leaders that only fossil fuels were sufficiently cheap and indigenous to allow India to escape the waiting room of history. And there is real path dependency in the kinds of institutions that were established at this moment. So for example, NTPC remains India's largest power firm and some of the power plants who, that were gestated at this moment, noticeably uh, Vidyanchal, which was eventually begun in 1982, has become the world's second largest polluting power plant with annual emissions the same as the entire country of Denmark from this one power plant controlled by NTPC. So these institutions still matter. Coal India too is arguably the world's largest coal miner and continues to underpin political settlements in much of the Eastern coal belt. So I think it's no surprise then that in the run up to the Paris Climate Agreement, um, Arvind, Arvind Subramaniam, then chief economic advisor, said that you know it, it was unthinkable that India could move off this path rapidly. Any attempt to force India off this path was carbon imperialism. Since it began around 1950 then, the great acceleration has witnessed different phases. 
And in this period that I'm calling the late acceleration, it is a shift to the huge growing economies of Asia that really matters. But it would be a real mistake to think that all that happens is an emulation of the political economy and political ecology of somewhere like the United States or Europe. There were very distinctive dynamics shaped, I think, especially in India's case, by this interesting, unique sequencing of democratization without industrial affluence and then rising political demands placed on an energy sector. These rising political demands mediated by democracy in turn channeled into the growth of new state owned enterprises. And I think this is a pattern that we as historians need to look much more closely at around the world. As you see in this graphic here, if we look at the 20 companies most responsible for carbon emissions since 1965, they are not all the typical villains like ExxonMobil that we might have in mind or Shell. In fact, 12 of the 20, the majority are state owned and 12 are headquartered outside the West. I think understanding our planetary predicament then means tracing the origin stories of these kinds of actors who are something much more complex than our usual narratives let us believe. They are neither environmental heroes, but nor are they cartoon villains. They are instead something much more morally complex, animated by fossil fire dreams and intensely political pressures that today lock in our rush into an overheating world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh... Thank you, Liz, the, for the wonderful talk. Uh, there's so much that you put on our plate, uh, you know, zooming in and out from the cold mafia, uh, which is closer home than many of us would want, uh, uh, to, to the global drought uh, scenario of 72, 73. Uh, I, I think that the, from what I, I won't summarize, obviously, uh, the three or four key issues that I wanted to draw you out more on before I invite others to, to speak. Uh, one is obviously this, this framework of the poly crisis that several scholars use now. Uh, I heard a lecture by Adam Tooze the other day using a similar concept uh, and, and how that is very different for the sense of a multiple crisis and, and how that allows for, for looking at systems and this, uh, this feedback loops that you saw between food, energy, climate uh, and things like that. Uh, the other is, if you could speak a bit more on uh, the Stargate Center to Stockholm conference, because there's so much that's uh, written about poverty as the greatest polluter, but this idea of limiting desire and, and what happens, where does it come from, where does it go, uh, it seems to be a very odd uh, formulation that doesn't find too much resonance, at least not in then. Uh, the third thing that is somewhat on the factual side is in terms of the middle class in the 1970s. Would it be correct to say that a decade or two, the real middle class demand for energy in terms of uh, massive use of air conditioners, uh, use of electric gadgets, so that in the 70s is probably still addressed as much to agriculture and industry as to the middle class. And the middle class really comes into its own post-liberalization in terms of its energy demands. And final comment was on uh, uh, this idea of, of this uh, morally complex. And this is something that you've written about elsewhere also. I find it very fascinating that we have to state of the global south you're saying these acts are more complex. Uh, they have to act world to deliver a number of, and equally, it might not be the case that uh, you know at all moments uh, justice is being served because the people who stand to benefit, uh, maybe the richer farmers, is certainly the urban middle class, not necessarily the most poor, even if the rhetoric is of welfare and state support and state provision. 
Uh, and I find that a very interesting argument about, uh, because so much of the climate talk is about who the villain is and, and who are the people who are the victims. And it seems a very bi a polarized picture. And you have a more morally ambivalent uh, cast of characters uh, uh, involved in this story. Um, so those are some of the issues that I thought uh, you brought out very well, some, and a few things that if you could probably expand on a bit. And then I'm just going to invite uh, those of you who want to put in your questions, uh, write it in the Q&A box, and uh, we'll have Phyllis answer them. So if you could start with some responses to this while people write in the questions. Yes, yeah, thank you for this, these very thought provoking questions, some of which I certainly need to wrestle with more as I develop this, this project. Yes, I mean, I um, have been influenced with the, by Adam Tooze's framing of this as a polycrisis, um, which I adopted after sort of sketching this out and thinking, huh, this sounds a lot like what he is labeling a polycrisis. Some of you will may know that the very idea of the polycrisis itself traces back to complexity theory and future logical thinking that was very uh, early on preoccupied with issues around um, ecological sustainability. So I think it is a, I find it very useful because of the methodological insights that I take from earth system science, which is that these interlocking systems of the earth, and I might add social systems as well, need to be viewed together in the ways that they influence each other, because in many ways they do operate as part of a single whole. So I think polycrisis captures something of the methodology that I want to take from earth system science as, as a historian in trying to write in everything from the atmosphere or ocean currents or plant growth into my accounts. Um, and it, but it has been popularized in very different ways to do with the Eurozone crisis and this kind of thing. I think that it's um, it's just a descriptive term and it's therefore like not it's not massively essential uh, in, in advancing our analytic in that way, but it's a descriptive term that matches onto a method methodological innovation I want to make. Yeah, I mean, where did the politics of limiting want or limiting desire go? I, in my book length uh, version of this that I would love to develop, I would have a whole chapter on Indian environmentalism at this moment, which I think is wrestling with that very question. Um, at the one time, on one hand, there is already an articulation of India's right to develop. On the other, there is a, a quasi Gandhian argument about the um, morally contaminating nature of overconsumption that let's admit it is mostly visible in the likes of the tuppers, you know, the Anglophone elites at this point. It clearly does not win because this is also the age where I could have talked about Sanjay Gandhi's Maruti experiments. And this mm -hmm. is the point where getting to your third question about the middle classes, that will be the current that dominates. Um, but it is always, always there as a kind of Indian powerful contribution to global discourses of environmentalism that really, I think, flicker into existence in the 70s and, and don't go all that, where, uh, that many places. So you see it internationally as well. There is a very in interesting document called the Kokoyok Declaration that talks about planetary justice in terms of what we'd now call donut economics, you know, making sure we meet minimum needs whilst not exceeding planetary boundaries. So, uh, you know, it, it's a direction I'd love to explore further that does seem to be a flash in the pan of the 70s and, and dies to death, but it's a really radical idea of, you know, cap putting a maximum limit on living standards. Um, and you see it in like people like Mulk Rajanand mm -hmm. and this kind of thing at this moment. Actually, I think you're right. The middle, the real takeoff of the middle classes is in the 80s with their burgeoning energy demands. And so a lot of this electricity is being earmarked for factories and tube wells. You're quite right. I think when 
the regime imagines its constituency, though, via, you know, English language billboards like the one I showed, it's clear that the urban middle classes are seen as a supportive constituency that will not just tolerate the emergency, but actually um, will find it popular as well. So in, in this way, you know, I think I, uh, teasing out the, the relationship with the middle classes is key. It's something that Arvind Rajagopal has gone some way towards doing. And yes, this moral complexity, I mean, I do think that the debate is often framed as it's all the one percent, you know, the Andreas Malm argument that you just put the heads of oil companies, 30 people on a bus and drive it off a cliff and we're saved, which is obviously far too simple. Or it's all of us equally. It's the hundred percent. The truth clearly lies somewhere in between. It's neither tenable, I think, to say that we are all just victims of you know the CEOs of oil companies, nor is it tenable to say we need to evacuate the concerns with energy justice and social justice from our frames. So that's really what my work seeks to explore is the constrained room then that late developers have to meet what is seen as a minimum standard of a good life at a point where planetary, planetary crisis is looming, because it is a tragedy. And it's that tragedy that, you know, I think that we're wrestling with. I'm very influenced by my colleague Depeche Chakrabarti's famous phrase that the mansion of, of modern freedoms rests on a base of fossil fuels. I take that very seriously that good things come with rising energy use. And, and most environmental historians just think all energy is terrible and, and coal is mm -hmm. completely awful and so on. I think we have to reckon with the the very, very difficult, morally impossible trade-offs between, you know, satisfying some minimal standards of living for everyone versus what looks like a headlong rush into crisis, as I, I said. So I think that in order to do serious work, we, we shouldn't be making polemics on the side of just pointing out villains. We have to look at the world as we actually find it. And that is a world of gray is often. Mm -hmm. Fatma, you, you had a question to ask? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Elizabeth. That was a really rich paper and uh, I learned a lot. Uh, what I especially liked uh, is uh, the way you have, in a sense, responded concretely and in practice to the question that has been raised by uh, for example, Dipesh Chakraborty's book, but also many others writing in the last decade, which is to ask, how does one think together uh, human history of politics and justice and the question of planetary crisis and, uh, you know, Earth? Uh, the, the kind of planetary and earth kind of processes and temporalities. I really liked the way in which uh, via the concept of the polycrisis, but actually not just that, uh, because the, the concept of polycrisis is, is as, you, as you just explained for us, is, is about connected earth systems, right? Uh, originally, it doesn't have, in that sense, human uh, actants in that. What you have done is kind of re reconfigure that concept to bring into that story the question of human history and human actants and human uh, uh, quest for justice and so on and so forth. And so when you describe something like uh, a coal community, in which you place the corporations, the state, the mafia, the workers, the tribals, the miners, and the coal itself, the, the forests. Uh, that, that, in, the, the, that description of that coal community to me was uh, really, really expressive and tells us in a way that somewhere the, the task lies in redescription, as it were. 
rather than the abstract question of human versus uh, the planetary or human versus the non-human and so on and so forth. So really, this is just to say that I really, really uh, got an insight into a question that I have also been, you know, struggling with from how you described your, your problematic as it were. One small uh, uh, query. Um, so Timothy Mitchell's carbon democracy, when it came out now a couple of decades ago, and really did not make it to academic attention in the way that it would have if it was published today, um, has a kind of counter argument to yours, which is to say that his story is from the shift, is about the shift from coal to oil uh, as a story of degenerating democracy, uh, primarily uh, globally, but also based in the Middle East, on the ground that coal mining and coal power allow a certain arrangement uh, of uh, uh, political collectivities, uh, certain possibilities of political action, such as, such as the one that George Fernandez tried, sabotaging the coal transport system. Uh, uh, it gave power to the hands of the workers to actually hold up the system and negotiate with the capitalist and the state. In response to the political potential of coal, as it were, there was a worldwide shift towards oil, uh, which went through underground and under sea pipelines and denied worker, worker uh, activism, uh, worker access and worker collectivity. Right. Um, and so therefore the name carbon democracy, I mean, you know, those, I mean, I'm just saying this for those who might not remember the book. Uh, so how, how, when I, how, how do you read that story uh, in context of, because in my imagination, while I understand that uh, much of Indian electricity is actually power, uh, is, is based on coal, uh, the fact that the public discourse is not so much about coal and mining and that domain of you know, political imagination as at, the, uh, as at the consumer end of the story, which is about power, uh, electricity. So has there ever been a political uh, uh, rendering of coal, including in terms of environmental justice, uh, in the story that you are telling, coal as such, rather than power, uh, in, in tandem to the Mitchell story? So just, you know, wanted your thoughts on that. Yes, this is a great question. At the moment, uh, Mitchell is relegated to a footnote, and I think that's a mistake because uh, uh, I uh, have spoken to others around this who immediately say, well, what about carbon democracy? So um, a couple of immediate things that I would respond to. I mean, if we look around the world today and we look at India and China, it's just an objective empirical truth that there has been no transition from the age of coal to the age of oil. We are still living in the age of coal in a very meaningful way. Coal mining, coal consumption in 2015 was at its highest level in all human history. So there's that broad empirical retort to Mitchell. But more than that, um, I am very influenced with Tim Mitchell's arguments that the materiality of energy sources really matters. You know, for him, especially in the article version of, of Carbon Democracy, I, I think. It's the fact that coal is heavy and unwieldy and therefore has and is in these distant mines and is therefore very concentrated that gives this power of sabotage to workers that provides the base of uh, carbon democracy. Whereas oil is fluid, light, can be transported by pipeline and tankers and so on and rigs are often overseas in ways that mean it trends more authoritarian because the power of sabotage now rests with big firms rather than uh, workers. I would apply a sort of similar argument at the consumer end to electricity. I think the power sector is often read as having a completely top-down authoritarian 
um, politics built into it. So, for example, Gandhi, very MK Gandhi, very famously said that um, a centralized power source would centralize power and would be something despotic. And we find the same thing in, um, you know, J Jim Scott or something like that. I actually think that in dispersing um, power, you know, infrastructural power is a two way process, um, both figuratively and literally, because then you have connections everywhere that many, many people can tap. They can actually steal electricity from or they can assert demand, they can assert claims over. So in that way, I find that uh, the electric grid is more democratic than I suppose most materialist thinkers have, have treated it as being. But you're right, it is, I don't see a politics of coal as coal emerging in this story in quite the same way as in the Mitchell formulation. Um, and I wonder if that is, I mean, this is sparking all sorts of interesting other thoughts, uh, a feature of the distance between the coal belt and especially by the 70s, the dominant Western dominance of industry and so on. That means that there is not the proximity to union interests in quite the same way that we get. Um, but th that's something that I'll certainly have to think a lot more about because, you know, the black diamond, the logo of Coal India, has a sort of real presence in one sense. And in the other way, as you say, it's sort of spectral for consumers. It's very much not front of mind. Yeah. If I could just add, Liz, one of the things that, that this does is, you know, there's been this great concern that labor histories and environmental histories seldom meet. And probably coal mining is a site where there's great potential for that uh, interweaving of those stories. As Some people are trying that, but quite clearly there is that uh, whole mix of labor and environment that's very critical in the coal sector. Uh, uh, can I then invite Dharanja Rai uh, to ask his question? Dharanja is a political theorist, kind of visiting fellow with us. Dharanja, you want to go ahead and ask a question? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor Seren. Thank you, Elizabeth, for your very powerful presentation. I My question will be slightly different from uh, historians, and I would like to ask something. That the energy shock. I mean, this is the, your hype. I mean, uh, is, is 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 important argument and thesis that energy shortage generated an emergency. And do you also relate it with the legitimacy crisis? And and and, and I think uh, uh, this uh, energy shortage uh, could be one of the factors, but legitimacy crisis would be a more uh, in an encompassing factors in terms of exhaustion of populism as a vi viable options. For, for Mrs. Gandhi. And uh, 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 carbon uh, concerning carbon democracy, and the critic would argue that, is a non-carbon democracy possible today because uh, of, of, of the increasing uh, Gini coefficient, uh, Gini coefficient uh, uh, in various, uh, among various communities and also nation states. Thank you so much. Yeah, these are wonderful, great, big, rich questions. Um, absolutely. I would buy into the framing of this period as something of a legitimacy crisis. Um, and what I would, I mean, and this is, you know, to, in the debates on the emergency, I think where the literature is trending is reading the emergency as a symptom rather than merely the expression of, you know, an individual's pathologies, say. Um, but where I would go even further is to say, that we need to link this legitimacy crisis in India, uh, we need to recognize its family resemblances to legitimacy crises that yes, are going on in the rich industrialized world, but play out in very different directions and certainly with somewhat different energy ramifications. Um, and as I've suggested in other parts of South Asia and even beyond, um, Speaking of Ethiopia, for example, where the legitimacy of a divinely ordained emperor is completely eroded at this moment. Um, so I, I think coming on to your second question, um, I think, you know, where I would go is, is to almost agree that we have to recognize that a 
pillar of political legitimacy has, as it has emerged is a an access to a certain quantum of energy, you know? And I think in that sense, it is very, I can imagine a non-carbon democracy, but it would still be very energy intensive. It would have just substituted something else in for coal. What is, I think, harder to imagine is a democracy that does make the move that um, Arudendra is asking about of saying we need to limit once. There is, I think, no political project that is at all palatable to a mass audience that actually says you know, less is more or something like this. So I think you're, that, you know, I I, um, I agree with you there that um, it, this raises some very unsettling questions about the range of political possibilities that stem out of this as legitimacy has become bound up with energy. And I think that connection has only become more profound in, uh, in India itself, you know, whereas in the 70s, we're talking about a moment where, um, off-grid energy is still something like 48% of India's entire energy usage is still firewood and dung and so on. Now we have um, a regime that has deliberately interconnected the personality of the prime minister with the provision of things like electricity or um, LPG and so on in a, in a whole new way. Um, so there's much more to say on, I think, that connection between energy and legitimacy. Yeah, we have a comment from uh, a colleague, Ravi Sundram. Uh, it's a longish comment, I'll just read it out. Uh, Hi, Elizabeth, enjoyed your talk very much, particularly the mission of the argument. I was curious about how you would separate clusters of time in your story. That is the oil crisis, 1973 emergency, regional ecology, and more long-term temporal cycles, where political actors and politicians seem to become weaker players. Uh, then he goes on to write, how do we map these temporal cycles? And I was thinking of a way we can balance political expression and your project of opening that conversation. That is, can we talk of this time as more than political speech plus planetary moves? So yeah, in, in some senses, these, these different temporal uh, configurations that are there in your, in your writing and in your speech, uh, how, how does one kind of bring them together? Yeah, this is a really interesting question. I mean, I, for one, I would say I don't think that these are necessarily cyclical. I think what the Great Acceleration shows us is we are moving into or have already moved into a completely new phase in planetary history that is unlike um, the entire scope of climatic conditions that forget industrial civilization gave us agriculture, gave us literate civilizations and so on. As we've moved out from the stability of the Holocene in the last, which gave us the last 11 and a half thousand years, you know, we've clearly exited the world of the cycle. And that too is another sort of challenge about how we do write ourselves into, you know, the Anthropocene, the great acceleration and so on. Um, this question of how to write about multiple temporalities together is one that has really plagued me and um, I have no answers, especially in this project, I think, where I am in some sense taking quite conventional periodizations and, um, as Pratima says, like read, offering a thicker redescription or maybe not thicker, but more multi-layered description rather than writing all those temporalities in. But in another project that I'm at work at work on with a student, uh, Satchit Pandey, we are looking at the Koina earthquake of 1967 in order to grapple with these questions. So some of you may know that the earthquake at Koina in 1967 is the most widely agreed example of a very contentious phenomenon. That is, can a human built reservoir trigger earthquakes? Um, and this is, is open the door for us to grapple with how we simultaneously write about the temporalities of the Deccan traps, you know, this multi-million dollar year history by which the geology of the Western Ghats is created. That means that it's an ideal, ideal dam site versus, you know, the temporalities of dam construction versus, say, 
the electoral horizons that mean the government of Maharashtra and indeed other Indian governments did not take the lesson that maybe there was something to say seismologically troubling about this. Um, and I, we're trying to write this paper now, and we're, we're really struggling with it. The solution we're coming up with there is to somewhat use historical actors categories to reflect on the ways that um, they too have narrated themselves as interacting with deep history. But I don't always know that that's satisfying because, because as an environmental historian, many of your actors could not possibly have known about the natural cycles in which they were implicated. And I think that in and of itself really is very challenging as historians in how we actually think about archival evidence, say, and the voices that we are listening to in the archives. So that was a long way of saying, I'm not sure I have a very satisfying answer, but you put your finger on to what I think is one of the key issues that we as historians are trying to grapple with, especially at a moment where the future is not going to look at the, like the past in the very basic sense that the underlying climate conditions have changed. So our whole vocation as a historian, I think, has to alter. We can no longer say, oh, don't worry, in my grab bag of historical examples, I've got something that looks like this case because of that underlying change in context. Um, but that's some of this is so philosophical that it's above my pay grade and into the world of, of Depeche. And I would, I would uh, point everyone towards this excellent uh, climate of history and uh, planetary age book um, as a way to, to tackle this further. Yeah, that's, that's such a profound question and such a difficult one to answer. Uh, this, this whole, I mean, when the actors themselves are not conscious of the long temporal cycles that they're part of. Uh, um, Dr. David Singh Bhai Prabhatma for one final reflection, and then we can end for the day. Uh, Prabhat, you had a question to ask? I saw raised hand. Oh, there he is. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, Elizabeth, for uh, this wonderful and morally complex story that you told us. It was fascinating. I have only a small uh, 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 point. Uh, I got this uh, suggestion from your talk that there is a subtle or deep linkage between the story of uh, nationalization of natural resources and uh, the coming up <laughs> of authoritarian power in South Asia in Indira Gandhi and its and her emergency. And if I compare it with uh, the contemporary, with the present moment, it's the it's not the same. I mean, it's other way around. It's it's the authoritarian personality, and not nationalism, but rather the uh, the free trade logic or uh, yeah, the liberal story. Uh, state is uh, running away or losing its control. Yeah. That's all. And. Uh, if you have uh, my fully uh, just just a uh, you know line thank you it was a wonderful uh, very wide ranging usage of you know cartoons headlines everything i really enjoyed it uh, uh, i also you know i think there is a very subtle uh, not so subtle actually suggestion that the, this uh, global politics around environment degradation and its protection is not so simple and so while, you know, it, and it is very much linked to the story of democracy, uh, and then the time question, of course, which Ravi Sundaram asked, that there are different temporalities to politics as well, uh, uh, the, the, the globe, uh, globe over. But are you, are you uh, 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 not shifting the terrain then uh, of, of this ethical claim that the third world, uh, you know, politicians are making and putting it there? Uh, uh, so you are seriously questioning uh, that as well. Uh, while they are, uh, I mean, we are battling with uh, what Prabhat just described as a, re, uh, I mean, authoritarianization of politics and denationalization of resources uh, at the same time. Thank you. Um, yes, well, to take the uh, nationalization is it some relationship with nationalization and authoritarianism 
question first. Um, this is a great moment for my hot take on the Modi regime, which is uh, that this the present government um, is very good at talking the talk about deregulation and privatization. There has been a real rollback, I mean, since 1991 in many sectors of the economy, but I do not see that the state has stepped away from key sectors like energy by any means. The way that the yeah. state intervenes is now different. It is, for example, very committed to the idea that state-owned enterprises must be able to compete with each other and with uh, private competitors in a way that looks very different from the license Raj. But if you look at the degree of control that is wielded through um, regulation, through financial arms, and I would say as well, the two private firms, conglomerates that dominate in uh, private electricity generation and petroleum and natural gas, they are so proximate to the state that I think rather than seeing them as, you know, arms of some uh, unleashed private capitalism, they're better off read as almost hybrid firms that are in themselves creations of state policy. So that is my very hot take is that um, I do not think that the present conjuncture actually shatters this. I think what it does show is a very different change in state tools and in the idiom by which this is happening. So I mentioned, for example, um, you know, the Pradhan Mantri X Yojana, Y Yojana, and so on way of doing this as well, and mirrors in some way the what Indira Gandhi in a much more abstract way is sometimes credited or blamed for doing in overleaping intermediate organizations in appealing to um, the masses. But this is in a very literal way. I think that some of these schemes do it. And then you can look at a nice dashboard on your cell phone and, and, and have an unmediated relationship with the state in that way. But the, so the tools have changed, the uh, idiom has changed, but I think that that broader relationship remains similar. Um, Prabhat, perhaps I could uh, ask you to, to clarify your question a tiny bit for me. So you said I was shifting the ground beneath third world leaders. Could you tell me a little bit what you, you took me to be doing there? And So your last graphic, if I could just rephrase. Okay. Yeah. yeah, your last graphic had that hint that look, uh, you know, the, the, the 15 or 20, uh, you know, uh, uh, companies that you listed are producing a lot of carbon footprint, right? So they are equally, equally to blame. Uh, uh, and not only the, you know, sorry, if I got you wrong, yeah, you can clarify. Yeah. Yes, I'm not saying equally to blame by any means. Uh, that would be, I think, a terrible, uh, you know, strange blame shifting exercise. But I'm saying if we want to understand the forces that exist and shape our energy sector today, we have to recognize these firms are central. And, you know, the, this tr argument about historical responsibility is fast changing because so much of the emissions we live with is in my lifetime, you know, it's since the mid 1980s. So if you look today, the US is responsible for about 20-ish percent of historical emissions. China is now at 11.4 percent, is second, you know, which is more than, than the old European imperial powers. It looks very different per capita, but not that different anymore. Um, you may know that in historical responsibility, India is edging up there towards, you know, Germany and the UK and so on. So I do think that we need to be careful that historic debates around historical responsibility, which were framed, for example, in 1991 um, by the great interventions of, say, Sunita Narayan and Aaron Ag uh, Agawal, uh, Anil Agarwal at this point, are not fixed in aspect, partly because I'm very concerned that the United States just will quite happily drive the rest of the world off a cliff. And I think we do need a, a carbon politics that admits that there can be sources of action elsewhere without waiting on the, what is this enormous malign actor and saying, you know, well, we're not doing anything until you do anything. The US is 
um, this is the, to me, I mean, to end on a very grim note, the great cosmic injustice of climate change in that it will hit first and worst the exact people who did not cause it. Um, it is a cosmic injustice. Unfortunately, a practical politics has to engage with with some solutions that don't sacrifice enormous numbers of people whilst feeling resentful, I think, of that injustice. And so that is almost, it's a pragmatic uh, argument I'm making rather than a, a purely moral one. Returning again to this, this grain, moral grayness that I see seeping through all of these questions. Well, on that sobering note, uh, let me thank you, Liz. <laughs> so, sorry, uh, sweet dreams. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but but that will be a great so lecture, but also for wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. It's been a great pleasure. And thank you for the fabulous questions. I'll be looking back thank at the you. recording, <laughs> grappling with them further. <laughs>